time. And uh, I think what I'd like to do is um, pass the mic to Allison and Kate. So we'll just switch over to you. We'll just take. Okay, we're still getting Zoom bomb, so we're going to take care of this and open it up to Kate and Allison. Oh, so um, Kate and okay, we've we've gotten rid of the uh, the Zoom bombing person, hopefully for good. And then, uh, is it Kate or Allison who's going to talk first? Okay. Allison. It's Allison. Okay, and She's then do you want to do you want to share your screen? Um. Yeah. So. Um, um. Yeah. Can you can you hear me, Pete? We can hear you really well. All oh, right. Okay. So, what I'm going to do is. Um, I'm going to uh, show a little slideshow of uh, photos of us when we were kids. So it's kind of, it's probably the first 20 odd years of Martin's life. So it maybe gives a bit of a background to, I don't know if you can see traces in there of who he subsequently became. And yeah, anyways, um, I'll, I'll, share the, I'll share the show now. Are, can you hear me okay out there? Yeah, cool. Okay. Wonderful. Okay, here we go.
Thanks, Allison. You're welcome. It's, uh, I... Sorry. No, no, go ahead. I, you know, I don't know if that's self-explanatory from, you know, to someone I, you know, I guess you never shared those photos with you, right? <laughs> uh, I, me, I mean, I, I've never seen a very many photos of kind of baby Martin. Uh, so it's really <laughs> wonderful to see and, and see where he, yeah, you can definitely see the, where some of, some of these things are coming from. Um, I guess I would call now on uh, Ingrid Bachman. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Ingrid Bachman and I was a close friend and collaborator and colleague of Martin. I'm gonna be emotional, but so it should be. Uh, Martin, as we all know, was a brilliant programmer, circuit designer, a talented musician, drawer and curator and caring human being who inspired and mentored many generations of artists and um, contributed to many uh, artists' work, including my own. And I think I can honestly say that as an artist, I've worked with many different collaborators, many different programmers, circuit designers, sound designers, and I've never worked with anyone quite like Martin who could really understand and be so respectful of someone's vision and ideas, no matter how crazy they were. And also, it seemed almost the crazier and the more difficult problem you gave him um, and the happier he was with it. Um, so there we go. Um, I can't read my notes. So, um, so Martin, I think, was really unique in many ways. I think I can safely say he was brilliant. And he had this remarkable combination of being incredibly sane, incredibly rational. He could see things in such a clear headed way. But coupled that with this incredible creativity and artistry. Um, he was, everything he did was fueled by this intense curiosity and he was truly a polymath. He was literally good in so, so many things. He was good in electronics, in programming, in sound, in playing the guitar. He was excellent at drawing. Um, he was also very funny if you could hear him, <laughs> because he did tend to mumble. He had a very wry sense of humor. His passion for the environment, for cycling, um, I think is, is kind of legendary. Just to, I think, show the, ex the, the breadth of his interests, you know, his library included a subscription to Space Weather Quarterly, Nature Magazine, Scientific American, he also had a really passionate interest in the pre-Hispanic Mayan culture, in particular the, the Petan, or what's called the Dresden Codex, which deals with astronomy, mathematics, astro astrological tables, the moon, conjunctions of solar bodies, cosmogenic theories, religion, agriculture, magic, and mythology. He was also really interested and knew a lot about the physics of dragonflies in flight. Um, his library included a star atlas of reference stars and non-stellar objects, which may be the nice name of my next piece. I love that title so much. And these interests were much more than interests. He was deeply knowledgeable in these diverse areas. Uh, Martin himself was a bit like the Maya Codex, a human scientific, astronomical, um, environmental, electronic Google. You could ask him anything and um, he would almost on any of those topics and he would usually have an answer. He also cared deeply about the environment and um, he also cared deeply about social justice and the inequities of the world and the corporate greed were something that he felt was really passionately angry about. But he also lived his beliefs. He rode his bicycle everywhere, only took public transit in the worst of conditions. He used open source programs for all his needs and he contributed um, really brilliant software patches on pure data to the pure data community. That is, those patches will have an impact and have had an impact on artists' work 
internationally. He was also a voracious reader of a number of dense and some might say depressing tomes by the likes of philosopher George Lukács, um, rise of capital, like um, fascism. And every now and again in the studio, we'd have to say, OK, enough, we know the world is dark. But um, there was this real intense involvement of what it meant, I think, to be a citizen in a world on so many levels. And it's something that I really um, take away. I value his incredible contribution to my artwork, which is kind of immeasurable. I, I think he brought so much to it and, and also to my life. I miss our conversations, his weekly weather report of the galaxy and his humor. As you may know, as you all know, Martin was intensely shy, but he was very funny. And so I miss him. Martin, dear wizard, I hope you are among the stars and the novas and supernovas and pulsars and meteors and nebulae and cosmic rays in the galaxies. And in closing, I'd like to show this very short video clip. Um, the studio I had at Concordia was called the Institute of Everyday Life. And Martin was a part of that for probably the last 15 years. And one day in the studio, nothing was working out at all. It was just hopeless. So we decided the next day in the morning, we had a morning to write a TV show. It was going to be a news hour. And then in the afternoon, we would record it. And we did this in this very room. And so I'd like to show you just a few of the outtakes from that. Hello, and welcome to IEL News for this April the 26th. Thanks for joining us. I'm Peggy Perfect with the latest news and stories from our Montreal studio. Beauty tips for you, okay. And next, we have Beauty Tips for You by Verushanika. Thanks, Ingrid. That was really beautiful. Um, next up, uh, Lorraine Odes is going to say a few words and join us by Zoom. Oh, hi, Lorraine, are you ready? You're still on your microphone, uh, if you could turn on your mic. Thank you, Peter. And sorry about that, I didn't realize I was next. Um, I, I guess I would just like to start by telling um, Nora, Allison, and Kate how terribly, terribly sad and sorry we are that Martin is gone and that he was a wonderful presence in all of our lives and that we will miss him dearly. I also like to thank Ingrid and Peter and Benoit for working so hard to organize this event for today so that we could get together and have an opportunity to talk about him and um, share some stories and also, sh you, know, um, sh you know, share, share a moment, um, some very precious moments about our experience with Martin. 
Um, now, I teach at Concordia University, as, as many of us do, and I was one of the artists who was very, very fortunate to work with Martin on a regular basis since about 2008. Um, I think I, I can't remember when I first started, um, when I first met Martin. I think the Inca program started in 2005. And so I've certainly known him for that long. And, and you know, and probably had, you know, knew him. I, 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 to be perfectly honest, I can't even remember how we started working together, except for I would have known him from the program and, you know, and talked to him on many occasions and then had a project where I just asked if he could help me with the programming and electronics. So from 2008 up until about last year, he regularly came by my studio on a weekly basis. And, um, you know, there were sort of periods where we would, where we'd work more in a much more concentrated manner. And then there was periods where, you know, that, that you know, we'd be working less often, but there was a very kind of long and, and important um, relationships and, and friendships that I had with Martin. And um, um, <laughs> one of the, I just wanted to tell you a little bit about the process in terms of us working on a project, usually I would start out and it was always, always often be very informal. We'd be sitting at a kitchen table. We always had lunch together. And I'd say, well, do you think this would be possible? I have this idea if an art project, would this be possible? Sorry about the telephone. <laughs> it's just going to be one of those days, isn't it? Um, and um, and um, and then he would kind of usually have a, have, have be able to kind of almost immediately tell me whether or not, yes, this would be possible. And, um, and then we would spend many, many, many hours, um, uh, you know, starting by him sort of drawing hand schematics, breadboarding prototypes, creating max patches, uh, designing printed circuit boards, and very patiently and systematically troublesho troubleshooting. And then at that point, we'd often go back and revise a lot of things because as an artist, you're always creating new prototypes and things don't work exactly how, it, how it's planned. So Martin is somebody who had the capacity to be very patient and, and humorous within all of that and just be part of the process. Um, and, um, you know, additionally, he was so invaluable in terms of telling me what, to, what kind of equipment to order, what kind of electronic equipment, what kind of electronic components. Um, and, um, he, you know, he worked with an incredible amount of patience and, and sensitivity. And there's not it's, it's a very rare experience to, to be able to have that kind of collaborative relationship with somebody who was really um, um, had a very, it was very, very deep, deeply impl implicated in, in all of the work that we did together and which wouldn't have been possible without his, without his participation. Um, anybody often, you know, we, I would also be working with other people, anybody who ever Mar uh, knew Martin um, really loved him and appreciated him. Um, and he's will be so sadly missed. And as I mentioned, I, I just feel extremely lucky to have known him, to have worked with him. And I'm very um, 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 appreciative of the fact that that he is still alive in some way in all of our artworks that, and he will still be with us in our memories. Thank you, Lorraine. Um, I have uh, Barbara. Uh, are you here, Barbara Ling? I believe you have a few words that you wanted to say for us. Thank there we go. Hi, everybody. Uh, it was wonderful to see that video off the top of Martin's uh, childhood and growing up in England and Quebec and also to see his sisters and his mom and how normal everybody looks and beautiful and wonderful given how extraordinary Martin was. He just didn't seem like he could have come from a normal looking family like that. We really enjoyed him. He was a member of my studio as well. Uh, he was always like, for me, the best thing you can do in life is be of service to others. And he was of service, but never a, a servant. He became a team member, a family member, a, a good friend. And he um, not only sort of did the mechanics of what it is you needed, he also had feedback and became a full collaborator and contributor to these projects. In fact, 
one time I, I had, I make these electronic garments that often have texts scrolling through them. And those texts can change depending on different circumstances. Um, normally they're very artistic and thoughtful kinds of texts, but one time an institution that we all know asked me to sort of use them as a platform for a special event of fundraising. And they had all these platitudes, these affirmations they wanted these words running through the textile. And I handed these to Martin. I said, Martin, can you program these into these clothing? And he just looked at me and he said, well, you know, I can, but do you really want to do this? You know, and he, it was quiet and his eyes were this big. And he, you know, what he was saying was, do you really want to sell out like this? And he, he did it and I needed to have it done, but that's just who Martin was. Even though he said very little, you just felt like he was always kind of keeping you in check and, quietly challenging. He was a such a, a quiet force in all of our studios and all of our lives. I, I'm, I'm just so happy also to see on the website, the memorial website, the stories that people left there and so surprised of how many lives he's lived and how many people love him and how many, like how he's so surrounded by love. I'll stop there. Thank you. Thanks, Barbara. Uh, yeah, I guess we're almost getting to the part where we're hoping to open the floor and if anyone else here or by Zoom wants to share some words about Martin, uh, we can do so. I thought maybe I could start it off because uh, I'm another Concordia person. Um, you know, we're at Concordia, it makes sense. Uh, and it's like I would echo Barbara and say like, it's is really amazing and wonderful to um, s like be connecting to all these other worlds of Martins that I kind of knew about or would get hints about, or uh, like we have people here from, like there's people from all over the world and like who've known Martin for 40 years, 50 years longer. Um, and I'd love to hear stories from, from that time um, me, I think, I guess the only things I would maybe want to add to this was uh, Martin's, like, so Martin was also, he was working with artists and working in their studios, but he also had an immense impact on uh, all of the students that he encountered. Uh, like, I mean, so, so, such a mentor to so many students and so many people who came through Concordia over the years. And I remember one particular moment in my class, like I think this happened several times, you know, we would have our final end of year critiques and everyone's been working on their projects and just really kind of freaking out and kind of finally bringing it all together and getting them done. And we would always invite Martin along to participate and join and, and say stuff. And almost, you know, like every year I can remember, he would get kind of like a round of applause, like at the end by all, when we would, we would, I would say, thank you, Martin. And then just kind of spontaneously um, classes of students just erupting into applause because they appreciated it and loved him so much. And of course, Martin would typically just kind of like shuffle and be shy and like be very like kind of demure and look at his shoes, which I think is one of the reasons he had these like golden shoes is because he was so often looking at his feet, um, I found. Um, the other thing I can talk about a little bit is like, um, Many of you know, like Beanie, his cat was really important to him. So we've, uh, my partner and I have ad adopted her. Um, uh, there's probably some, uh, sorry. Um, maybe, uh, I, okay, I'll just sort of pull myself together. I, like I, yeah, I really miss Martin, like, <clears throat> like everybody. And I, I think it really sucks that the last time I saw him was on a Zoom call, but you know, um, Beanie is like, you know, this wonderful creature that's come into our lives and we love her and she's like a you know there's 
photos of her kind of circulating on the slideshow. I, like it took a lot of work to just kind of work it down to just 10. You know, like she's kind of 90% of my phone storage is is beanie. Um, and you know, in, a, in some way it's like a real, like I feel like Barbara was talking about Martin living on in people's work. I mean, maybe in the personality of this cat, like there's something like a, he was, really loved this cat. He would talk about her all the time. Um, I had never actually met her until she kind of uh, joined our, our household. And in some ways, she reminds me a lot of, of Martin. Uh, I mean, not the parts where she's like this morning coming in at 5 a.m. and jumping up on the bed and crawling all over the place and asking for food. Um, I don't know about that side of Martin at all, really. Maybe this is true to form, but she's a weird little kitty. She's got a very distinct personality. She has all kinds of strange things I've never seen in a cat before, like a very diverse vocabulary of behaviors and mannerisms, and it's like amazing. Um, and uh, she's really cute, you know, like Martin um and she's talkative when she gets to know you and but she's a little bit shy um so we just really love having this creature and this connection um in our lives still um i could probably talk about her for like you know half an hour more or you know and probably will but i actually like i said um like i think we'd really love to hear for some some folks who um you know there's no pressure you know, but I know there's a lot of people here from uh, Martin's other universes, as we mentioned. Um, you know, so if there's anyone by Zoom or in the room, like hey, maybe Benoit, could we give a um, a shot of the room for the people uh, at home who can see? I think it might be number two. Nope, that's the wait. Is it? That's me. So here's for the people at home. Uh, here's everybody here. Uh, oh, waving, yeah. I mean, we had strict sort of capacity room limits here. Um, uh, but there's a there's a good group of people, and it's really nice, and it feels like there's kind of a community gathered around Martin to, to remember him. Um, so I don't want to put any pressure or, or anything like that. Maybe we can just, you know, put on the slideshow. We can be in the room for a while. We can have some background sounds starting again that aren't, I think it was Arturo was Zoom bombing us, I don't know. Um, and if anyone is so inclined, uh, they can they can speak. You can let us know in the chat um, if you're by Zoom or here you can just stand up. If you're not comfortable speaking at the front of the room, we can give you the microphone. <laughs> it doesn't start very well. <laughs> I was supposed to pass after Lorraine. I wasn't able, of course. Um, I worked for 15 years with Martin. For the last 10 years, it was a, a daily uh, visit with him. Monday to Thursday, roughly from September to April. So sometimes just to bring a box, uh, sometimes to bring something for him to repair for me. Um, and very often just to chat or hide from the students. So it was, um, you know, anyone who uh, knew Martin uh, at school, the workshop in the basement was really his kingdom. It was really like, uh, an interpretation of his mind was uh, beautiful. You just enter there and you just feel the magic because there was like so much things going on. Uh, so I miss that, I miss that a lot. Um, so it's, it's still very hard, but um, just see that today, the little video, uh, that just remind like, a, it's happy, happy souvenir at the end. So, yeah, good get better.
Well, maybe maybe just to kind of follow up on a couple of things that people have said, Benoit. Um, Martin's, I think I completely agree that Martin's um, workshop was a complete extension of his mind and also the way that he kind of navigated the world. And it's, it's very rare to have somebody as idiosyncratic as Martin within this kind of institution. And it's so important to have somebody like Martin as in, in idiosyncratic as Martin within an institution like Concordia. And it's, it's, it'll be a real loss to not to be able to go down to that room anymore and just be filled with the different types of energy and uniqueness and complexity and complete and utter chaos <laughs> that 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 room exuded. Um, and it, it, it will probably not never be the same um, it, because most people are a lot more orderly. But that sense of of um, idiosyncrasticity is... When haces tus momos en videos, el futuro es hoy, ¿oíste? <laughs> <laughs> Pero te terminas bañando. Oh, mi gente de contacto. Speaking of which, <laughs> it, it's really important to an institution and it's a, it's a very extreme loss that for, for us as individual artists and as an institution that he's gone. And again, as I said, Martin would often work with me on a weekly basis. And I would usually ask him, well, how are the students projects coming along? And he'd often say, well, you, you know, that, that, you know, often I would go, oh, here we go again. <laughs> uh, um, I think I've lost my train of thought. Um, but yeah, often I would go down often, you know, sometimes like, like, um, not, not, not nearly as regularly, but often I would go down, um, during classes or, or after I'd finished class or before I'd started class. You know, because I had a question and it was always so nice to see him and his the relationships that he had with students they were obviously so appreciative of him and they also enjoyed working in that kind of in that kind of environment um, but sometimes i would ask him how are student pro projects going and he's he'd usually say well you know they hadn't really kind of engaged with him that much and i used to joke with him um, that if he if he if he ever got sick um, at, you know, at the last two weeks of classes, <laughs> no one would finish their projects because it was so typical of students, in part because it's the nature of the courses. There's so much, um, there's a real steep learning curve to the courses in electronic arts and programming and to absorb the information and to kind of actually make things. I think often it was left until like the real building happened during the last two weeks. Um, but it was just a, a, a humorous joke that I had had, had with him for Lorraine, a, a long period I, of time. I'm going to just, I'm just temporarily going to interrupt you. Like um, Sam just sent me a link how to like lock the Zoom. Oh, meeting. great. Yeah. So I'm going to oh, okay. do that. It might take me a second because I've never done that before. So that's okay. That was, yeah. I was done. I was, that was it. Beanie playing snakes on the couch for folks in the room.
So um, I don't know if, if, yeah, the folks in the room here can't see the chat. It's kind of lighting up a little bit about how Martin would love and appreciate the chaos of this kind of Zoom bombing is probably looking on it somewhere and, and laughing and finding it quite hilarious. Um, so, yeah, I mean, yeah, I've never been Zoom bombed before, so there is a definitely humorous aspect to it. And then thank you, Sam, for sending us this link on how to lock a Zoom meeting. So we're working on that right now. Um, but uh, Amanda Don Christie mentioned that she had a story that she wanted to share about Martin. Uh, and Amanda is coming. Are you coming to us from the East Coast? I am. I'm in uh, New Brunswick now. Fantastic. Welcome. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Okay. So, um, yeah, I guess I uh, knew about Martin before I knew Martin. Um, his work within the pure data community and the, all the patches that he made in the libraries um, I used, and it was the sort of thing, the first thing you do with pure data is you download the Mr. Peach stuff. And I thought it was Mr. Peach. And I didn't know if that was a person or if it was a collective. I just knew that really, if you're going to do anything in pure data, you had to have that stuff. And um, when I moved to Montreal and started working at Concordia, I didn't really know many people. And um, I remember, and I found out from Ben Wavit, Martin in the in the basement was Martin Peach. He was the Mr. Peach, or so I thought. Mr. Peach, and I was like, Oh my gosh, like Mr. Peach works in the basement. This is amazing. I need to, I need to meet him. And how can I meet him? And Ben was like, Well, you'll you'll know him if you see him. And I was like, That's very vague. What do you mean I'll know him if I see him? He's like, Well, he's got long gray hair and he wears gold sneakers. And for like, I think I'd only been at Concordia for maybe a week. And then like the next two weeks, Martin's contract hadn't started yet. But every time I was walking down the hallways, I was looking at people's shoes. Every person I was like, do they have gold sneakers? Does this person have gold sneakers? And um, yeah, so then one day I finally, I was like, okay, I'm not just gonna randomly find the gold sneakers. I need to actually, you know, go down and say hi. So I came bearing a coffee and a cookie and went down and I, I think he was meeting with Ingrid at the time. And I was like, are you the Mr. Peach? And he's so humble. He was just like, it's not Mr. It's Martin Richard Peach. It's MR Peach. And I remember just being kind of awestruck, but also so touched. That I was like, oh. And so I haven't known him as long as the rest of you. But for the three years that I was three and a half years at Concordia, I really, um, yeah, I went down and talked to him a lot. And he worked on one of my projects. And um, yeah, my last real firm memory is at uh, one of Ingrid's Christmas parties where me and Martin and Dana were the last three people up drinking and talking about conspiracy theories and surveillance and um, yeah but anyway so that's yeah his reputation preceded him I knew the in uh, with all the work that he had done thank you Amanda uh, I mean, speaking of drinking, uh, <laughs> I really wish we could all be, you know, eating and drinking here. I kind of wish I'd maybe had a few drinks before I showed up. Um, you know, maybe I would be more verbal. Um, does anyone else here in the room, does anyone have any words or any stories they want to? Yeah, Phil, All right, do you want to, do you want the mic? Can, is this detachable so easily? Oh, you won't come up? Okay. So it's uh, great. <laughs> it's great to hear uh, all this recent stuff. Uh -huh. I want to talk about before. I met Martin in 81. He lived with his girlfriend in a loft above the distributor of Harley-Davidson part. 
on Ontario East by the Lorignan, right next to where the hell's at their bunker. And uh, all, all that is now a park. Uh, he left before the war started, which is why at some point the city just totally eradicated the whole neighborhood. Uh, so Martin, because of our uh, age group, we were a part of that punk wave, the kind of Anglo original punk wave, because you had a little punk wave around McGill with Lord and those people, but that was a very inside thing. Punk took a long time to come to Quebec. And uh, he was in a band with his girlfriend, Lori, called Mau Mau. And uh, did it shows around town in places that don't really exist anymore or change name. And uh, then he went to India, except that uh, he stopped in Banff. And uh, he came back years later and uh, uh, he moved in with a whole bunch of us in a place called the 259, which was on uh, St. Catherine, right in between Fufun and uh, Ucam. So that was a very intense period. That's where he got a micro professor and would spend days and nights programming this eight bit computer where he developed all this knowledge that you people talk about. <laughs> And uh, he was also uh, always into guitar. And one detail I want to mention that nobody seems to mention here is uh, Martin's deep passion for Mylar. Uh, if you look at his, any one of his, even in that basement thing, he had Mylar. Everywhere, Martin would put Mylar in the windows. He uh, was just obsessed with Mylar. Uh, uh, during the 259, we started doing this project called the Septics, and uh, we did a lot of stuff. Uh, I don't think we could call ourselves a band. We, we got involved with music, but we did a lot of soundtracks for theater and uh, performances and stuff like that. Uh, at one point, there was a a record that we participated in called Panic Panic. And I don't know, I sent a track called Homing Device. I don't know if you guys have that. Uh, but uh, that was supposed to be uh, a device that would yank you back to your body after astral traveling uh, above suburbia. So I guess that gives you an idea also that, oh, oh or why does mind range? Uh, after that, lots of things happened and Martin and I, we had very intense interactions and then he'd go away or I'd go away. And uh, unfortunately, about a year before his death, for some reason, he didn't want to have any contacts with me anymore. But that wasn't the first time, so I wasn't too worried because I used to go before that regularly to his place in Verdun and we'd spend the evening and make some noise and talk. And and uh, so I think the lockdown and the closing of Concordia had a very, very negative impact because as a person, he wasn't very outgoing. So, Spending a year by himself, I think, did serious damage to his psyche. And that's why we're here today. Okay, well, that was that. Je m'appelle Alain Bergeron. J'ai connu Martin en même temps que Philippe, un petit peu après. Dans, au début des années 80, j'aimerais vous parler d'une petite anecdote. C'est que euh, je travaillais avec la Société de conservation du présent et on avait fait un logiciel qui générait aléatoirement et perpétuellement de la poésie. 
Et le problème, c'était que c'était fait sur un Macintosh qui était un, un gros ordinateur. Donc, en parlant avec Martin, on a décidé de faire un ordinateur complet. Et moi, j'ai fait le logiciel et Martin a tout fait au complet, tout un ordinateur autonome. Avec, C'est un petit ordinateur à peu près ça de gros qui était épais comme ça, avec un petit écran de 500 pixels par 256 pixels. On pouvait mettre trois ou quatre lignes de texte. Et euh, en fait, c'était un peu l'ancêtre du, du iPad. Et Martin a construit ça en 1986-1987. On a construit deux exemplaires. Le premier exemplaire, le problème, c'est que à toutes les fois qu'on le connectait, il y avait un seul logiciel. Tout le, le, le système d'opération, ce n'était que la cambre d'aine qui générait. Donc, on connectait la petite boîte. On mettait ça sur le mur et la poésie commençait à générer. Mais à toutes les fois qu'on le déconnectait, qu'on reconnectait, c'était toujours le, le même cycle qui revenait, les mêmes phrases. Donc, puisque le hasard à partir du logiciel, c'est toujours la même chose, ce n'est pas du vrai hasard. Donc, Martin a construit un petit module qui a inséré dans l'ordinateur qui générait du vrai hasard. Et c'est un module inspiré du noise qu'on a sur les ordinateurs euh, analogiques. Et donc, à partir de ce moment-là, à toutes les fois qu'on connectait le petit ordinateur, les, le, il, il, il commençait jamais à la même place. Et donc, c'était beaucoup plus intéressant parce que c'était continuellement euh, aléatoire. Maintenant, dix ans plus tard, euh, j'avais une petite compagnie qui s'appelle Loplop, qui existe encore, et Martin est venu travailler pour moi en 1998. Et à ce moment-là, on a eu, on, on eu l'idée, vu qu'on on, on avait fait un petit peu de, de logiciel pour l'Auto-Québec, de faire ce qu'on a appelé un « dice box », c'est-à-dire de prendre le petit module qui générait du hasard, et Martin en a fait une boîte et qui génère, qui génère euh, aléatoirement jamais les mêmes logiciels, le, le même série de nombres. Et on l'a proposé à l'Auto-Québec, qui ont été très sceptiques. Mais finalement, on, ils, ils ont testé le Dicebox avec des statisticiens à l'Université de Montréal. Et ils ont accepté d'acheter euh, le Dicebox. Martin en a fabriqué une dizaine, toutes euh, euh, faites à la mitaine. En, en fait, on avait un, un, un circuit imprimé, mais c'est lui qui a tout monté. On en a vendu cinq ou six à, à l'Auto-Québec. On en a vendu à la loterie en Suisse. Et aujourd'hui encore, à l'émission euh, La poule aux œufs d'or, qui est une émission de l'Auto-Québec, c'est toujours le petit Dicebox de Martin qui génère aléatoirement tous les prix et qui donne des millions. Merci. Ouais. Merci Alain. Merci Phil. Euh, incroyable. <rire> Dicebox encore à l'Auto-Québec, OK. Uh, et j'ai un petit soulier. <laughs> And yours too, Ingrid, uh, golden shoes, yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, the, these are great uh, stories to have uh, from outside of Concordia, pre-Concordia. Uh, Phil, I believe we have those tracks from you, and I think at some point we had them on loop, and we have them available. Um, you know, so we can um, certainly look for them and and try to have them playing, and we'll even see if we can maybe even figure out a way to get it to stream onto Zoom. It's very complicated to we've found to just suddenly it's very complicated to have sound and video all going to all these different places. Uh, is there anyone else feeling like they want to share or, uh, I mean, I think it's fine to just kind of leave the, the, the mic open and, and, and leave the zoom meeting going. We can take a moment and, um, maybe we can bring up some sound and no pressure. <laughs> We're not done yet. We're just taking a moment. Uh, 
maybe what I can do at home, I uh, uh, I have um, if you you kind of have me in speaker mode, uh, I've got uh, or pin me like I've got uh, all of these slides like. And thank you everyone for donating their, uh, I mean, I keep calling them slides, but their photos and drawings and images. It's a slideshow of, of uh, from Barbara, from Bill, from Ingrid. Uh, we put some of Beanie in there, of course. We couldn't resist uh, from all over the place. And there are uh, photos of Martin. Um, this is Beanie. <laughs> Uh, okay, yeah, I think we're on the, we couldn't get it to shuffle, so this is going through the beanie section. She loves that cattail. Um, and there are photos of, of Martin, some young photos of Martin, photos of Martin's drawings, and folks that he loved and worked with. Which is confusing? Sorry? Oh, that was the file thing. Got oh, okay, okay. I mean, yeah, I guess I'm confused. And I think what I'll do while we're kind of taking this moment uh, to to just sort of think and reflect, um, I was playing for the folks here. Uh, I was able to play a video file of Lorraine was talking about Martin's uh, chaotic lab downstairs in Concordia, and we managed. We did find some video footage of this, um, like kind of like a, like a record player with a, a the ball from a mouse and a penguin and a badminton, kind of all sort of spinning around. So I'm gonna line that up and, and I'm gonna share that with the folks on, on Zoom at home as well as the slideshow. Hi, I'm Nelson Henricks. I was one of um, Martin's colleagues here at Concordia. I just really love this idea of a generateur d'hazard. And I think like the Zoom bombers today kind of represent that spirit of like the generateur de l'hazard. And maybe like the, the phone that's ringing behind Lorraine during her presentation as well. It's like, I, I feel like Martin's presence is really with us here today in this lovely way. I just had a really short thing to say about Martin. What I remember about him is he always had like really excellent pants. And I remember he had like this really great pair of like light blue, uh, really tight skinny leg jeans with like a leopard skin pattern on them. And he had really, really impeccable uh, fashion sense. And, and he had a really like distinctive look anyway everyone's testimonials today are just so so touching and thanks everyone for organizing this it's it's been really great to hear all these aspects of his life
Were folks able to see the video on Zoom? Took a little bit. Yeah. You could hear it okay? Good. Well, I think, uh, you know, we're, you know, getting close to a feeling like a time where it's maybe we're at a conclusion. If uh, no other folks, um, want to say anything right now. I won't close the meeting. Um, I'm going to stick around here. Maybe we can all stick around here and, and just mill around and, and talk. But I just want to say uh, thanks, everybody, for coming. And thanks for being here. Thank you, Martin. And uh, if I had a glass, I would raise it to Martin. And I would just raise a Pretend glass to Martin. Thanks, everyone. Uh, there's one thing, the last thing I want to say, and it was just because the last year, and it's again one of those things just about Martin that I forgot to mention, is he's, he got himself a USB microscope. And because he was such an avid cyclist, he would go to the mountain, he would pick up rocks, like really boring rocks, or what looked like boring rocks. And then he would look at them through the microscope, and he'd see these incredible cryoids that were in there, all these different life forms. And I, I sort of love that image. 
both of him being in the world looking at something that everyone else would uh, overlook and, and finding just like diving into uh, a whole other series of, of life forms and life. And I'd also like to raise a glass. I wish I had one to Martin and also to all of you. Someone has a story about a squirrel that I'm dying to hear. Is someone going to tell that story? I can't tell if that was somebody on the audio track or if that's somebody on Zoom wanting to tell a oh. story about a squirrel. That was me, Amanda. I was just saying in the Zoom chat, someone mentioned a story about a squirrel and I would love to hear it, but I don't know if... Oh, I want it. Oh, Dana, I want to hear a squirrel story. Uh, sorry, we got caught up in, in there's like... It's yeah, Jane let's hear a squirrel story. story. It's Jane that needs to tell it. <laughs> Hey, Jane, I think your microphone is muted. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, this won't be very coherent, <laughs> but I think it says a lot about who Martin was. Um, both like a very passionate animal lover, but like also just very grounded and down to earth. Okay, the story was, we were both at his place on Bernard Street and um, I could hear some creatures screaming out in the alleyway. I looked out and I could see a little thing running around a baby squirrel being chased by all the stray cats in the alleyway because there were so many and because I was flightier in those days, I started to get kind of panicky. I didn't really know what to do. You know, I wanted to help this. And Martin just very, very calmly went out to the alley, picked the squirrel up by the scruff of his neck and brought him back into the house and put it on the floor. And then the baby squirrel ran up his leg and started trying to suckle on his shirt and uh, then kind of passed out because it was so traumatized. And um, so I went out and got a squirrel feeding kit, a syringe and uh, puppy milk is what we used um, that I had to reconstitute with water. And it was the best baby. And I, I'd heard that baby squirrels are the best babies because it would sleep all night, like for seven hours. But then during the day, it needed feeding every four hours. And we were both working. And so Martin would put, <laughs> Uh, squirrely, as we called him, we put squirrely, he put squirrely in his backpack and ride to Concordia on his bike with the squirrel and the feeding kit in his backpack. And then he would feed the squirrel every four hours at work. And uh, I think his boss, Bill, knew about it. But, <sighs> oh, I guess the other part of the story I didn't mention, I guess because is that I was really worried because it was too late to go out and get food for the squirrel the night we got it. And I worried all night about it, but Martin did it and you know, he slept through, you know, he wasn't, he was practical that way. I got a little sleep, but anyway, um, so yeah, that's, I mean, his, his love for animals, for nature was incredible. I, I used to call him mother nature's son. And uh, okay, I think I'll sign off now before it gets a bit embarrassing. Those are really cute pictures of Beanie. Yeah. Martin. His love for animals.
trust them with his incredible honesty. He was such an honest, he was so honest. He would always tell you the truth. Okay, I am signing off for now. <laughs>
like chaos and in a way darkness but then he himself was such a kind of a light spirited person or at least that's how it, it felt having him in the studio he was always very funny he was always very warm to everybody I mean I will I will never forget his like giggle like that I'm gonna really miss from all of our uh from our Senka sets after our work days were over um it was also really nice to see that footage I have to say that that filming day, Ingrid, was still one of like my most cherished memories of, of my time in Montreal. Uh, that was really, it was really quite a day. I think we should just release the entire reel, which is totally unedited. <laughs> Maybe it's the funniest, funniest that way. Um, yeah, I know we wanted to like pull it together into an actual show, but like maybe, maybe it, it, it deserves to live as outtakes. True, funny. Um, but yeah, I just, uh, you know, I, I said this on the, on the memorial page, I said it to Ingrid, but I really, I just, you, sometimes you take for granted that it's like, you're going to see that person again, and you're going to be able to hear their, their view on the world again, and you're going to get to like, share a glass of wine and, you know, like, just compare notes about how ridiculous this last couple of years of it has been just in, in everything. And just knowing that that, um, on this plane will never happen is, I don't know, just somehow that's the thing that keeps kind of. Uh, stuff for punching me anyway but it's really good to see all of your guys' faces um, for those of you who don't know I moved to Edmonton I'm in Alberta now I got my Alberta tuxedo on <laughs> nice to see all of your faces I just want to thank everybody who put this together so I didn't know, uh, I feel like I didn't know uh, Martin as well as the people who worked the most with him, but obviously I knew him <laughs> because I was here and he were here, he was here and we, we worked alongside each other and crossed each other and talked for many years. Um, one of the reasons I didn't know him as <laughs> well as some other people, I think, was that I really admired him and I felt that um, he was extremely busy. <laughs> I felt that um, I shouldn't be another person asking him for something because so many people needed him. He was so needed um, and so well, well used. <laughs> um, and I, you know, constantly heard from my students. One of the, the things I thought was that the students who um, were uh, less able to approach professors. I, I, I never thought that I was terribly unapproachable. I, many of us, I think, felt we were not unapproachable. <laughs> but there's still like a, you know, if you're, I, I guess, well, if you're a student, I think uh, some, for many students, saying that you just don't understand <laughs> and you just can't do it, <laughs> you know, or you know, it's breaking down and saying, I'll never get this done, uh, was, is, is not very easy to do with your professor if you can even find them. Uh, and uh, so he was there as an just amazing presence, amazing resource, and, and I really appreciated both what what Ingrid had to say and and what Lorraine had to say, uh, you know, um, about his personality and the way in which that that was something special here, you know. So I'm wondering whether um, I, I I suspect uh, other people have thought of this way before me. Uh, but I'm wondering if there, if there could be something down in 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 the area where he he lived um, that has um, some of his drawings and some of his you know photo, some photographs and some what whatever you know just some sort of collection so that for people who are new or who or and I guess for people who who knew him that there'll be something about um, that reflects some of the things that people have been saying saying today.
We're not I being <laughs> we're not being zoom bombed. Uh, <laughs> no, we're not being zoom bombed. This is one of the tracks that Phil sent me of Mau Mau. No, I don't. I do not. Um, I'm not sure if the folks at home hear it. We're kind of hoping that maybe it will, the microphone will pick up from the speakers, but that was just um, a really raw track. Uh, so it is starting and stopping and it's not a Zoom bomb. And um, it's uh, Lori Little and she's here. She said, hi, Phil, in the chat. Um, and it's Martin on guitar. Yeah, it's recorded in the basement of Concordia in Really? In the little radio studio that was at best for recording. So okay. Uh, I'm not sure if that picked up, but like Phil was just mentioning that it was recorded in the basement of Concordia University in 1981 in a room that was not meant as a recording studio. So it was a radio. It was a radio studio. Wow. Sounds like it was a fun time. It was a fun day. Yeah. Yeah. We used to do stuff that people don't even imagine. <laughs> Could you maybe give us some examples of, of some of the things that you used to do that people can't even imagine? Well, when we lived uh, on Ontario East, it was a very dirty area. Yeah, if you want to come to the mic, yeah. We. I wonder if we have a roaming mic. Ah. Uh, so the story is, uh, when we lived on Ontario in the early 80s, it was a very dodgy area. There were lots of guns and prostitution and drugs. And... Uh, Every Saint Jean Baptiste, we used to take the amps and put them on the roof and play all night till sunrise. Nobody ever came. Nobody complained. You know, the from my experience, criminal elements tend to enjoy artists because we don't bother them and we provide some kind of cover. <laughs> so I just thought of something also uh, that nobody mentioned, but Martin had a succession of recording rigs, always improving them, the microphone and stuff. And when he was doing his bike rides, he would like go as far away as possible from human presence. And I don't know what happened to it, but he must have had humongous archives of bird recordings. He recorded birds for years. Thank you. 
Oh, I guess okay. that was uh, the we finished. We listened to a little bit of homing device, the astral homing device that Phil was mentioning. Uh, and I just figured out now how to share audio, computer audio with people at home. So um, yeah, <laughs> glad you got a, a little sense of that. And I think Aaron, did you have something you wanted to share? Yeah, um, my name is Aaron G. I worked with Martin quite a lot. I'm one of the many students whose uh, mind and heart he that Martin touched uh, while he was with us. Um, I'm really, really deeply indebted to Martin for like so many things that I know. My ability to be an electronic artist is like has been really enriched by me knowing Martin and working with him. Uh, in October 2020, he sent me <laughs> an email, and I don't know if this is related to what Ingrid had mentioned about how he got um, how he got a uh, a microscope um, camera or something. Because I I just thought I would share this image that he sent. I'm gonna have to see if I can share the screen. This looks like it's the one. Right. So he he sent this to me, and. He says, uh, 
here's a tiny fossil from 450 million years ago that looks like a crashed spaceship. It's from the beach next to the seaway. And I'm not sure where the seaway was, <laughs> uh, but I, uh, I don't know. I just thought I would share some Martin Peach art with everyone. Um, thank you, Martin, for the spaceships, for the tiny fossils from 450 million years ago, for the timeless knowledge you've passed on to me. That's it. everybody um, we can officially close it like don't feel any pressure to stick around of course um, but I'm gonna stay around for a little while and uh, no I don't think I'm gonna do that at all like uh, yeah, very, yeah. <laughs> yeah but we'll play some videos we'll poke through some other stuff that we have here and uh, I don't know if I'm still talking to I'm 
hoping that the folks on Zoom can still hear me. I'm not sure what you're seeing right now. Oh, you're seeing Beanie, of course, sitting on a sitting on a backpack. Oh, and a beanbag, one of her favorite places. Um, beanbag, Beanie, very appropriate. So yeah, I mean, we're gonna we're gonna kind of uh, officially end things here. I'm not gonna close the Zoom meeting yet. We're not gonna have any more Zoom bombing. Thank you, Sam, um, and thanks everyone for coming. Just uh, it's all to really say is thanks so much, and uh, let's all keep in touch. Think you know what's going on? And listen to me. And listen to me. And know what I'm after. Whatever you're thinking is right on the topic. I fucked up. You think you know what's going on? Listen to me. I know what I'm after. Whatever you're thinking is right off the topic. Listen to me. I know what I'm after. Whatever you're thinking is right off the topic. I'm right. It's all clear. I'm right. You just better follow me. Watch me.
Hi, Phil.
Star looking like a toy. I'm so happy. You never have a dream. Then you'll never have a dream come true.
fucking up the sound again? Huh?
Thank you. 